So guys, what we're going to do today is look at something really, really awesome. And this is a new program for me and for Miss Allison, I believe, and for Katie, because, um, and we're going to talk about innovation. In the newsletter, we talked about innovation and how innovation and need changed um, uh, how we live. So right now we're being innovative. This is <laughs> is being innovated because we need to meet a need. So at Miss Allison is going to talk a little bit about innovation of tools in ancient times. And I bet we're gonna have a lot of fun because it'll be involving guessing and oh, all those things that we love. So over to you, Miss Allison. Okay, hi everybody. I've been missing you all so, 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 so much. I hope you guys are all well. Um, I have been, it's only been about a week, but it feels like each week gets a little bit longer and longer. So I'm super, super excited to get back in touch with all of you because I literally think about you guys all the time and you are correct. This is gonna be a little bit of a new program, but we've all met so many different times. I don't wanna keep showing you guys the same stuff. So I went back and I really thought about this idea of innovation and I wanted to kind of explain how we understand innovation, not just today, but also in the past and also how innovation that we can see all across the globe Globe, right? How we actually can see that be something um, that we can explore and connect to our lives today. So this is going to be one of those really chatty programs. I'm hoping I'm going to share screen and I'm going to do more of a game where I'm kind of going to ask you guys to look hard and use the, that chat feature so that I can make sure to hear from as many of you as possible. Because you guys, the one thing that I take away from every single amazing program I do with you is that you guys teach me something every single time we meet. So I'm hoping you can help me look a little bit closer at some of our objects and really think about what is technology, how we define that, and how was that really defined in the ancient world? So I am going to share my screen with you so that you guys um, can make sure to see it. I am going to pull this up because I always like to make sure that I have my chat box that is over here, guys. And I always look at it in the wrong for the in the wrong window like a silly. Okay. So great. I have everything set up. So for those of you that I've met before, sorry, but I do always like to make sure that we know where we're starting. You guys meet so many amazing colleagues of mine in the content providers. So I just like to give you guys a little reminder. This museum you see on screen here, this is where I typically work. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed in that museum either. We actually right next door, so you can kind of see it right here. This is actually the University of Pennsylvania Hospital or the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And they right now have many, many first responders and many, many researchers, not only working to save and um, uh, hope to bring help to many different patients, but they have hopefully lots of work to do in trying to help us you know, see how we can get people better even before with what we have. So we're not allowed in our building, but what's really cool is that in our building, right, that's located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we study archeology span and anthropology. Now, typically I start out with that idea of archeology, span but I do wanna just kind of focus on the study of humans, right? Because our goal in the University of Pennsylvania Museum is really to just study all of our stories, our stories are the human story. And we wanna make sure that we not only find objects that can kind of help us date history, right? But we also wanna make sure like always that we connect to language, right? Because I always say that people have been around for 100,000 years, but we've only really been writing for 10,000 of them. So we really look hard at not just what's written down, but what other things are people using to communicate with us to help us tell all about the world that they see around them every day. You guys know about our bones. We have the animal and the human remains. I'm not gonna talk too much about those practices today because we can dive into those anytime. Instead, we're gonna talk about how technology and innovation really connects to culture, our understanding of how groups of people connect. 
Now, what I decided we could do, because every time I meet you, I tell you about, we have a global collection. They come from all over the world. So I thought, why not spend some time looking at different parts of this collection, looking at different parts and objects from around the world that we don't typically get to chat about. Now, the majority of what I'm going to show you guys, it comes from archaeological excavation. So at the museum, at the Penn Museum, our collection has about 1 million objects. So not saying the objects don't remember include the physical remains. We have 1 million objects, okay? And we have a lot of those objects, like we talked about, have scientists that help keep them in place. They have these amazing archaeologists and keepers that help them stay intact so people can keep studying from them, right? Now, what we're going to do is think like researchers today. Now, when we meet, sometimes I tell you, archaeologists, what they do is they use their eyes, okay? Now, it's absolutely correct. With one million objects, using our eyes is definitely really important. But in some cases, no matter how hard we look, no matter what we do, no matter where we find the object, we're always okay with saying we don't have enough information. Sometimes you just don't know enough to say, this is how somebody actually used it. This was the purpose of the object. Now, funny enough, if you guys can believe it, the world we see today is so different than the world that was uh, the ancient world, right? That was how the world looked different to each person. It was explored and explained differently to each person. So sometimes we'll have objects in the collection for like over 20 years, over 100 years even, and have no clue what it is, have no clue what its real function was in society. So what we did was, and you guys can check this out on our YouTube channel, in 1952, we decided to create a television game all about this idea of these obscure or these you know, difficult to understand objects in our collection. So what you see on your screen here are some uh, some screen some uh, actual photographs from our archives, right? So I put it right here in this little um, old film reel because this literally was um, broadcast from our basement, guys. So when we all get to meet in person and we all get to explore the Penn Museum together, we can go downstairs and I'll show you where this was filmed. Our host was the director at the time, uh, Director Rainey, who would gather different experts from all over the Penn Museum. Some of them anthropologists, some of them archaeologists, some of them linguists who study language. And what they would do is all gather around one object and they would ask questions. First, they would ask questions, which was pretty clear that they would have an assumption, what they thought it meant. Then they would draw back. With our specific director, they would be encouraged to think more about how they're looking at the ob object, which is what we're gonna kind of do today as we play around. Now, I like to think of this kind of as um, a doctor, like if you were going to go to a doctor visit. So this is the first time I'm gonna ask us to use those um, chat feature. If I wanted to do a deep description of an object, thinking about how I could explain this to somebody, if nobody saw it, can you give me some suggestions in the chat box? What are some examples of features we might call out to help explain or describe an object? What are some key words of what we could use to describe? Cool, so somebody's saying that we could describe if it's older, right? Okay, great. What else, if we think about an object, what are some of the basic features that maybe we could name? So maybe time, how it looks, okay, great that it's an artifact. Okay, great, so let's think about breaking it down how it looks. How could we describe how something looks? What's, what are some features we might name? If we think about how it looks, some basic ideas, like if I wanted to describe how this object looks, this object I'm holding in my hand here, how would this look to you? Great, so it's color is a really good example. So if I use color, I could say, this is a brown, kind of a brown to a light brown color. 
What else could we do if I was looking, if I wanted to describe this object you see me holding or any object? The size, great. So I can say right here, it fits in my hand, but it's about a little bit smaller about the palm of my hand that it's a full shape. I love that you guys say shape, right? That it's in a circular motion, that there's texture, absolutely. And then we have a question, how do they use it, right? That's the question we wanna to get to. So really, really good job, guys. So what we always like to say when we're thinking about, oh, and I like that, Charlie, great job saying feeling, right? How it feels, that texture when you feel it. So for me, this object that I was using as an example, this would be really smooth, right? It wouldn't be hard or rough. Really great example. So you guys pretty much named it. We're thinking about the material. That's where we're gonna bring in that structure, that, uh, that texture, the idea of the shape. What is it round? Is it tall? Is it standing? Does it look like a line? Is it a color, right? Maybe the color can even help us think about um, the material, the idea of the size, and if there is a design. So not only is there a texture, but if you look closely with my object here, you can see while it may not look like an artistic design, there is something going on, right, with that object. And then the other idea when we're thinking about archaeology, is it damaged, right? Is a piece of the material missing? Are we losing information? Because remember, we don't want to add anything. And then also attachments. When I say attachments, I mean, does it look like it hangs like a pendant from a necklace? Does it look like it's a handle, something you can grab and drink from? These are some of the examples that we like to kind of slow down and help us look. Now, that's only number one. Step number two, right, is making sure that we're going to ask questions that aren't answerable. So our goal is to say, if we could answer it through one of these observations, that's not a big research question we're gonna dive into. Instead, what we wanna do is ask deeper questions. Like some of my friend, like one of our friends said, how did it get used, right? Who was the owner of the object? What was, uh, what is this, uh, what was the significance? Was it produced widely? Where did the material come from? And was this area, was it made in the same area in which it was discovered? Now, these are just some examples. What are deeper questions you guys would have? So if I have this object in my hand, my little uh, artifact I'm using as an example, do you guys have any other questions to add on aside from what you see? What other questions could you guys add on? to what you see on the screen. I know I gave you a whole bunch of them. My animation did not work well. Great, so we, all, we, so we have some questions about the design. So what is the design like? So we can see that the, that's a great question, Charlie. So you can see all around my object that there is carving, that there is a design that's on the bottom, that's on the side, on each side, all four. And then even right here, you can see there's a light carving. Then it has an idea of height. How big is this, right? So going again with that idea of something that we could answer, we could actually get a tight measure and we could say this is where this would come from, right? Now, just to give you guys a little bit more information about my object here. So how is this object used? This ob uh, what is the purpose of the object? Great question, Maddie. So the purpose of the object, that's what we're really hoping to find. Not only because of the object connecting to a specific civilization, this here, for example, is an object that is whittle, that's handheld. It's a cir it's circular, but if you look closely, the object is actually a person. This relates to a specific tale in the Brahmana Gita connected to Lord Krishna and the story of a weeping Buddha. How people use it is not only honoring that story, which connects to South Asia, the area of the world, but I was given, I was given that this was given to me by a friend. And what you're supposed to do is rub your finger on the back to take away your worries. I put it right next to my globe, kind of as a little uh, significance in trying to say, I, you know, taking away my worries for the world. So that's an example of how art of how we can look closely to try to draw out the meaning of an object.
Okay, so that is how we're going to try to think about objects today. We are going to think about this idea of technology, and we are going to look closely at some objects to see how that connects to our our um, our bigger understanding. And then you guys can ask me a whole bunch of questions about those objects. I'll ask you some questions and you're going to be able to ask me questions like those deeper dives, like what we were talking about. And I'll probably direct you to think about that diagnostic idea, describing what it looks like. But first, let's get into our theme, right? So can you guys tell me in that chat box, what is technology to you? If, you, if, I, was at, if I asked you to define technology, how would you define technology? What is technology? Great, so I have somebody giving, a, Maddie is giving a really good example of an object. So someone is saying our electronics as well. So we have our phones, that's absolutely one. We have electronics. Anybody else wanna add on to that? What could technology be? What is technology to you? I like the idea of phone electronics because you guys know I'm a gamer, so I'm on those all the time. <laughs> so. Oh, yes, I love that some of our friends are saying device, computer, something you can use. Awesome, Gabby. Great way to think about it like that, because these are some great objects we're going to connect with. So I like to say, oh, yes, TV. I am a big TV watcher. I like it. So we I always like to say technology, especially if we're jumping back into the ancient world. Remember, and GPS lamps, all great as well. Technology is really defined as tools or machines or a method or technique that's created to solve a problem or to give us something new, right? So if we look back into the ancient world, there were a couple problems, right, that they wanted to solve. And we're going to try to figure out how they use technology to go past them. We also want to talk about this idea of technology helping us kind of move past the era we were in and move us to the future where we can find ourselves today. And Maddie, I like the idea of that Xbox. I'm a PS4 player hoping and waiting for PS5. I don't know if I'll get that right away, but I do like Xbox too. So I appreciate your uh, technology responses here. Now, you guys just did a really great job. You when you named a couple different objects, but I want to take that a little bit further. Can, in case we didn't name any, can you guys name some objects, some tech objects? If you think about or look around your houses or your homes, what are some examples of tech that fill up your homes? So we already talked about phones. We talked about different computers, TVs, lamps. I love the call out of the GPS. I like Xbox, um, again, the phone, the Wii, I like that. Oh, and I love that you're thinking about the appliances in your home, like the stove, a printer. You're so lucky, I don't even have a printer. So that's super, super exciting. A printer, a microwave, really great ways of thinking about it. What about how we move around, guys? What are some examples about like moving back and forth, on, like things that we see maybe outside of our home? Oh. Katie, I love that idea of a door handle. Great one. T PS two, one, three, and four. I like it. Cars, water horse, drills. Oh, I am really impressed. Cars, treadmills, Nintendo Switch. I like it. Hopefully, you guys are playing some Animal Crossing. You can find the Penn Museum on there. Tools. Great, you guys, I am a chainsaw. I like that too. Oh, and especially the idea of drills, chainsaws. These are definitely things we can see evolve over time. Scooters and a remote. I mean, guys, think about it. Just a couple years ago, people had to get up and move the television on there with a knob. Can you believe it? Definitely that remote is fun. Um, I also like the idea of clocks and bikes. Good job, and yes, we can, Animal Crossing. We'll get into that at the end, but we are on there, guys. You can see the Sphinx in it, it's super fun, and you can make yourself an avatar with the museum shirt. We can talk about it later, though. Okay, cool, so what you guys just named in the objects you were talking about, right, was this idea of communication, and guess what? We don't just have phones today. We actually see when we look into our collection, jumping back into ancient Mesopotamia or the ancient Middle East, we see this idea of communication being a true technology. The moment someone put reed to clay, we actually see how that communication began. 
The idea of transportation. I love that you guys not only named the cars, the idea of water, um, the idea of a whole, like a kind of a horse getting us to different places, but the idea of a bike. We 100% have different forms of technology that help us transport. And remember, not just ourselves. We can visit ourselves, of course, in airplanes, cars, but we also have these really big forms of technology, ships, trucks, airplanes that can help actually bring goods from one area to the next, right? So that's a really, really big innovation when we connect to transportation. And the idea of these devices that you guys named in your houses, from the idea of lights, which really can be in and outside of the house. I love that someone named a stove and also the microwave. Sometimes these are innovations that, and TVs and PS4s and Xboxes. I don't want to leave any of them out in all of the iterations of our PS, our PlayStations. These sometimes are areas that are left out. This idea of what we see around us, something that's considered mundane, uh, usual for us, almost are are forgotten that these are big forms of innovations. Not everyone always had a fork. Not everyone always had a comb. These are things through time we see evolve and really help us understand and track the human history when we think about innovation. So we are going to think about technology in a couple different ways. I'm really glad you guys named these objects because we're gonna kind of focus in on the idea of a household. We're gonna focus in on this idea of transportation and we're gonna focus in on the idea of what we need to move forward and see how that kind of connects in to communication. So let's start from the very beginning. In that chat box, can you guys name for me what are need, what are the different items we need as humans to survive? What do we need every single day as humans to survive? Great, so we have some examples of water. We have examples of, because I 100% agree we need water. Remember, most of our body is made of that. We also food, right? Not just any food, we need a steady food supply. We need to make sure we keep getting food. And that wasn't always the case when we look into the ancient world. Oh, we need hugs. I definitely need hugs as well. Um, and we definitely need shelter. I love that we say shelter or somewhere to sleep. Um, I agree bug spray is something I can, I feel like I need, but not something we need, need to survive, right? <laughs> we definitely need some warmth. We need the idea of shelter so that we have uh, somewhere to sleep where we'll put something to go to sleep and the idea of food. And thank you. You guys also named clothing. I really, really love that you guys named all of those, those ideas. So warmth could be in the form of clothing. That's 100% true. Also blankets, another really true example of the use of textile. And also this idea of different tools. Really, really good job in how we'll get there. So we're going to look at specific objects and we're going to connect them to some of these big threes. The big three I'm thinking is more shelter, the idea of food, and the idea of drink, having that steady water supply. Now, I do like that you guys are thinking about clothes, and I will tell you right here, these are objects from ancient Mesopotamia, one of the earliest settlements that we have a connection to, Tepe Gara. And right here is a spindle whirl. This was actually used to make clothing. And right here is a storage vessel that we saw, that we actually discovered. And it's almost like the, like literally guys, it's made, um, it's a rough texture, just to give you a basic description. It's made of clay, so it's a little bit coarse when you touch it, and it's almost the size of my body. So it comes up to about my, uh, to my waist, okay? So we are going to look at these three concepts. An idea of cup, which I really mean drink. I don't know why Miss Allison typed that. Food and this idea of tools, okay? So let's look closely at one of the objects we are going to look at on this world map. We're gonna look all over the world today. So right here is my first object. Can you guys in that chat box tell me, describe to me what you're seeing in this image. Describe what you see. And I will add on to what it may be. So we have some friends saying that they think this here could be something connected to a cup. 
number three. And we have another friend that said it looks like a shell. Absolutely. Oh, we also have a suggestion. It could also be used as a spoon. So maybe it's um, maybe that's what connects it to food. We have an idea of a shelter comes up as as well as number one. So I will definitely good job guys. So I'll definitely let you know this is a shell. It is made of a seashell. You can see that it's kind of half, which means part of it is cut off. And this is rather large. The base, what you see me circling, this circular part at the very top left, this would actually fit into the, about the palm of my hand, where this right here, a long fixture that comes out that looks kind of like a spout, that would be about the size of my finger, okay? So it's handheld, it is made of seashell, or a shell, and it does kind of become the size of your hand. So it would be able to be used as a handheld object. So my friends, go ahead and put in your last guess. Do you think that this was used as some part of the shelter, number one? Do we think that this was maybe a fork or a bowl, like what's been suggested in our chat, number two? Or do we think that this is a vessel you would drink from, number three? Let's see. You guys have a good between two and three. It is in fact, my friends, it is connected to a cup. Very, very good. It is a shell cup. Now, I really love this object. It not only reminds you that vessels, the idea of what we drink from is a really important technology because we go from what's been discovered in our area to the glass that we eventually blow and put different types of designs on. So we really see that innovation move forward. This is actually one of my favorite objects in the collection. It comes from the North, um, the, um, not, not Northeast, I'm sorry, guys, the East Coast of the, uh, of the United States, specifically in um, an area that's excavated in Mississippi. So there is a connection to Native American nations here in the United States and their connection to mounds. This cup specifically comes from that area and something that's really exciting, a dig that we don't normally, we don't normally get a lot of archeological excavations here in Philadelphia. And one of our archeologists uh, really dedicates a lot of her time to this. And she was able to create an entire uh, exhibit about what was discovered and the meaning of mounds, which is really, really, really special. Um, and a really special thing I hope we can explore together in the future as well. All right, guys, now I want you first, before you guess your number, I want you to tell me, what do you describe the object on the screen? Describe it for me. What do you see? And what questions may you have about it? Okay, so describe what you see. Great, so one of our friends is saying that there's a shell. They see a shell. I agree, I definitely see shells as well. What else do we see? So we have identified a shell. Is there anything else that we notice? Maybe, oh, maybe it looks like a spoon. So there's a suggestion of it's a spoon. A, an, a question, Does it? Is it a musical instrument? Maybe a rattle because, and then our other friend was saying that right here we see a stick connected. Very, very good. So we've identified one element shells. We've identified another element right here, a stick. What have we forgotten? What's something else that's included that we haven't talked about yet? Good. Absolutely, good job, guys. So you're talking about the rope, okay? So we see right here that there's a rope. We have a stick. What we see is a seashell on this side, and actually underneath, we're gonna see another object as well. Good, you guys, so, so good. Now, tell me, what do you think this was used for? Do you think this was a tool used for shelter? Or do you think this was a tool used for food too? Or do you think I'm being tricky and saying this is another, another uh, artifact used for three, a drink? What do you guys think? One, two, or three? Awesome. It looks like, here we go. It looks like two is winning and you guys are correct. 
This is actually one of my favorite, favorite objects in the, these are actually all a lot of my favorite objects in the Penn Museum collection, but I have a special connection to this one. This here is an octopus lore. So first, look at how great you guys did in your description. So number one, you identified a specific shell. So these would be two shells that are wrapped on top of a rock. That's giving us weight, okay? Now, what we see is that rope, okay? The rope and that's, uh, that you guys connected with and the idea of a tree, the stick, actually connect to the uh, coconut. In the area, the Pacific, the Pacific Islands, where this object is from, it actually, this area actually uses coconut, the different forms of coconut to create that texture that we saw as a rope. And the tree branches would be broken to make that long stick. Now, let me tell you what we can learn and why we can learn about it. Now, we know that this becomes a steady food supply, a way of actually luring in and capturing octopus, which would be a great way in the Pacific Islands, uh, specifically this area of the world and this object coming from Fiji. So this area of the world is called the Pacific Pacific Islands or Oceana. It's a whole collection of objects of sea bearing peoples, which is amazing. Australia is even connected in there and you guys will meet Mr. Ben next week. He's really wonderful. So our octopus lore actually comes from Fiji. And what they would do is place this. There was a lot of seafood that was eaten, a great way of getting that steady food supply. Typically, we're thinking more about what happens on land. So I wanted to give you a different example as well. We actually know not only with this lure in an octopus, it being something it's attracted to, thinking it could eat the octopus, thinking it could eat the lure. Instead, it would be a hook attached to pull up that octopus to give the food. But also there's a legend in this area that said that an octopus gave a rat a ride over to shore when it got pushed off a boat by some other legendary creatures. After the octopus gave a nice ride, the rat was not very nice. And the, the octopus had swore vengeance moving forward, which is why if you look really closely, you can see how right up here we have that body and a little bit of a nose, kind of like a rat. And then right down here, that stick kind of looks like a tail, giving us more connection, not just to the materials and the necessity that this innovation filled, but also a little connection to the legend, which I think is pretty fun. All right, guys. Now, our very last, does anyone wanna tell me, what do you think this object is? You may have seen it before. I know we talk about Roblox now some, but I'm a Minecrafter. This is a very important material um, in Minecraft. It is, it is a volcanic glass. So we had a suggestion of a stone, but who can tell me what is the material that's considered a volcanic glass? You might need, and it is, yes, Charlie, it is shelter. Very, very good. So this would be something connected to shelter. And this guys is obsidian. So if anyone's like me, the absolutely may have mined and worked really hard to open some portals to get some obsidian. And this comes from ancient Mesopotamia. I had one of my friends actually record a video. I think I've showed this to you guys before, but this is an example of how obsidian is used to create tools, okay? So the tools, sorry, I'm just gonna pull this down. So the tools here are actually the obsidian core, which we saw before, this blade would be made with the back of an antler, something used from the animal. And what would happen is you would not only have this blade, right, that's maybe as sharp as a butter knife. Typically, what happens with these obsidian blades is that, like you'll see in this video here, they'll be backed with wood or bone. So not only is this really, really sharp, so it can be a kitchen tool, it can be easily made a blade to become a tool to chop down the different things needed to make your home or stabilize your home. So this is an example of how tools are made to kind of create those different forms of shelter, all right? You guys, so, so good. Now I wanna play a game because we have a really big collection 
from um, the ancient Mediterranean world. We've talked about Rome before, but we also have objects from Greece, and we also have objects from uh, the Etruscans, the Etruscan civilization, which is actually one of my favorites, because you can talk a lot about metalwork. Now, what I'm going to do is I want all of us to kind of do the same idea. We are going to think about different things that we do in our houses. So we all have to hopefully, right? We all want to make sure that we're washed up. So we have, um, we're going to talk about what was the first form of like a washcloth, or if you like loofahs, I put that up on there. Um, we also have the idea of clothing. Now, people may not think that a safety pin is a technology, but trust me, if you need a dress to close or if you lost a button, a safety pin is an extremely important form of technology to keep that clothing up, right? Now, I also like the idea of a story, but I'm not just thinking of any story. I wanna think about a visual story, the idea of our comic books, using pictures to tell one story. And then our friend um, earlier today, I was so impressed. They kept talking about a light, right? Thinking about a light source. How are we lighting up the space? That's one of the most important innovations that we can come across, okay? So we're going to look at objects. I want you guys first to think about before we answer our question, so no numbers. First, I want us to describe what we see, then I want you guys to give me the number and then give me a reason why you think that, okay? So the first object we're looking at here, give me some good words to describe the object. Remember, we're thinking about those basic features. Describe that object, thinking about the things we've discussed before. Great, so we have a suggestion, this is, it looks like it's stone and that would make it hard, very good. That it looks like there's carving on it or some type of hand design, very good guys. And that there's a question of maybe it's a candle holder. I like it. So just to give some of those basic features, right? You guys talked about this being a hard material. It is, it's not only hard, it would be smooth. Very good in talking about the design that was made by hand. I like that you're seeing that there's like two different forms here, right? So it looks like a candle holder because we have one circle inside and then it looks like we have a larger circular base. Somebody's giving a suggestion of maybe this could be an olive oil pourer. I like that idea. I also like the idea of a candle holder. What other questions do we have about it, guys? What other questions could we have? Oh, I like the idea of it being a gravy boat or maybe some suggestions you can give me. What does it look like to you? It could be a gravy boat, an olive oil pole, uh, candle holder. I like those ideas. Oh, somebody is suggesting a teapot. Maybe it's used to pour out, absolutely. So good guys, you guys are doing really well. So you gave me the basic features. What I always like to say is just to connect to your to the basic features you guys brought out. So we talk about, somebody said maybe it's stone. So what material is it is a really good suggestion. We just got another question. What area is this from? What specific area did it come from? And we could take that question even further. Was it made there? right? Was it found by the person that made it or owned it? Really good questions, guys. So let's check it out. First, you guys tell me. Now it's time for you to give me a really good suggestion. Do you think that this object could go to washing? So we talked a little bit about a gravy boat and candles, not so much about washing. Could it be something connected to clothing? Is it telling us a story? We talked about that design. And then we also are talking about light. What about, what are we thinking? Overwhelmingly, we have a number four. Good job, guys. It is 100% an oil lamp. So our friend that suggested the olive oil pour, Charlie, you're not wrong at all, actually. So before there was torches, right? Do you guys think you'd wanna walk around your house like this, just carrying around a torch? You can go ahead and tell me in the event chat. Anybody interested in just 
walking around with a torch? Yeah, no way. Nope, I don't think so. And they definitely did. It wasn't until Edison or Tesla, depending on who you want to agree with in that argument, comes up with electricity. Or do we have the light bulb, right? Now, the first iteration, what we see is actually an oil lamp. So what would happen is right here, olive oil would be poured into this center hole. And instead of a candle, because that was just a little too expensive, a piece of clothing would be pushed right into this top hole here. That clothing would be pushed down to the circular base. It would be a puddle of olive oil. It would be lit and carried through the room so that you would be able to kind of light up each space like we do with flashlights or our lamps today. And we have a question in the, we have a question for Ms. Mally in the, in the chat. Is there anyone here that might have, I actually got to connect with a school group, which was so wonderful. And they told me about how they actually have a lamp that is similar and connects more with um, animal fat, that seal fat can be used to uh, within that lamp. Does anyone have any connection to that here today? It's okay if you don't, I just was wondering if anyone has seen or connected with a, an, a lamp that might function similarly. Okay, if not, don't worry, we will definitely get connected. We'll definitely make sure to see if we can get connected uh, to get you guys some images and some connections to that lamp. Now, what about this guy? Oh, yes. Okay, good. Someone knows all about it. Yes, the Inuit lamp. Guys, I was so excited when I heard all about this because what we saw, what I got the class to come and bring and actually show me one. I felt so, so, so excited. It made me feel so close to that class, to the understanding of the culture and also the understanding of how we see these amazing innovations today. So it really makes me so, so happy. Oh, okay. So what about this one, guys? You guys can go ahead and quickly tell me, what do you see here? Describe what you see. What's going on in this? It's pretty basic. And then we can get, it looks like a blade. It looks like a hoe. I like it, like a hoe that you would uh, dig into. I like the idea of it looking like a blade. What about it? What about guys? It's stone or metal. Very good. Thinking about that material. Very, very good. So I can let you know it is definitely made of metal. So another suggestion of it looking like a spoon. Thinking of the shape since very, very good. Uh, since it's kind of dipping down here. And then right here, we see that it has like a handle, right? A little bit of a connection. So very good guys. And I will let you know that on the outside here, this is actually rather smooth. If we think about the texture, those basic features and also inside you can actually, it's actually a little bit raised. So it has a little bit of bumps. Now, good suggestions. So we, uh, we have a suggestion. Could this be a, like a ladle? That's a good suggestion. Maybe a spoon. Let's see. What do you guys think? Do you, with our objects that we have left, we have already used light. So do we think that this could connect to ancient washing, number one, an ancient connection to clothing, like a safety pin, number two, or do we think somehow this is telling us a story like a comic book could today? So what do we think? Two, one, three, what are we thinking? One, two, or three, all right. It looks like we have a nice even weight between two and one. It looks like you guys have more ones than two and good job. Guys, this is like the ancient washcloth. So if you can believe it, the hygiene that we understand today didn't come around until like the 1830s. I know, gross. But what we see is that in ancient Greece, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, so this is like ancient Mediterranean, they were actually trying to remove the dirt. So this is called a strigil. This strigil here is very good, Charlie, and thinking about that shape, it looking like a spoon. Now what happens is it does kind of have a hook. You would take this, you would place it against your skin and you would scrape all of the dirt, grime, and dust that attach to your body. 
Now, typically these, because they're made of metal, very, very good, were rather expensive and only really um, something that connected to families that would have the ability to kind of have this ancient method of, um, you know, the, the ability to buy something like this. And also, guys, for the gladiators. So we find in most cases, strigil attached to an abolos. Now, we have soap and we use a loofah or a washcloth, right? Now, in, ancient, in this ancient Mediterranean world, in Greece and Rome, what we see is they'd actually put scented oils into this abolos, and then the strigil would be um, kind of hung. So that little space that we called out before right here helps us dangle. That's an attachment, right? Helps us dangle this to connect it from the oils that it would be held in that vessel. So what happens is you scrape off that dirt, the oil's placed on top, and you're able to kind of um, walk around feeling as fresh as a daisy. And cool thing, guys, I like the green thing better as well. And cool thing, guys, uh, gladiators, the most popular ones, would scrape off all of the grime from their bodies, and it would be bottled and sold kind of as a, a way to get something from your favorite gladiator. So I don't know if I would want the ancient dirt and sweat in a vessel, but you know, it's pretty cool. Okay, what about this one? <laughs> totally gross. What about this one, guys? Tell me really quickly, what do you see? Describe a little bit what you see there. So suggestion of the material being stone, we're talking about it, uh, the design, so very good looking. You can see really closely here, there is a little bit of a design feature here. And it is, so there's a kind of a connection between stone or metal. I will let you know it is metal. Maddie, great, I love that you're thinking it might look like a hair clip or it might be in a clip shape. Guys, I am so impressed. So go ahead and tell me, what do you think it is? We have two options left. Two or three, do we think it could be a connection to a safety pin or there is a design we called out? Could it be telling us a story? You guys are so good. It's 100% a two. Now it does kind of, it doesn't look as plain as our safety pins are very, very good, but this is actually really, really significant. We see fibula the first form of a safety pin be used not just in the ancient Mediterranean world, but we kind of see it across the ancient world. So this would typically be used to wear a toga. So togas weren't used every single day. Togas were kind of fancy dress. So what would happen is once it was wrapped, a fibula would attach right up in the shoulder area of the toga. Now, what would we also see is in burials, people would give fibula as a way of honoring the person that went before. Typically, these had connections to very wealthy families and even military um, assignments eventually. So, um, same as, yes, it is. It's like the same of the net as one of the legs in your, in your body. And Charlie, I am so impressed. If you see here, you can kind of see how both of these very thin pieces kind of do look similar to the, the bones in our body, like our anatomy, right? So we have a thicker bone and a, a thinner bone. So we definitely see that connection. Really good association. You are an archaeologist, all of you. All right, guys, our very final one I'm going to let you know is a story. So instead of comic books and books that we might see today, typically they were writing on papyrus and papyrus wasn't always in a book format that we're familiar with. Quite typically that could be in scroll form um, if it wasn't just one sheet. So a lot of times the stories that we're told and that we see in the ancient Mediterranean world are actually right here on painted vessels. It's one image telling one story. And this here, guys, is actually a connection to a specific story of a family. And this individual right here is holding a strigil. So I thought that that would be something really, really, um, really fun to show you guys. And I do like that you guys are talking about the description. So some of our friends are saying this is this in the shape of a pot, that we see that it's in a vase shape. 
We see attachments here too, guys. These are our handles. And we have two different designs. We have design up top that's more of like a fresco feature patterns. It looks, and then this great painting, I agree, of two images that are telling us that story. The same way we might look at the, the comic books today. Now, I don't want you guys to think this is the only way we find information. In some cases, we can look in some of those early artifacts and discover stories that not only connect to the animals in the area, but we see symbols representing to gods and goddesses. So we have a way again to connecting to those cultures. So the, we had a question. We had a question about the texture. Really great, really great question. The texture of this object is this. So this is made of clay. So and because of the painting and the firing, this would actually be really smooth and soft. So the texture would be really extremely soft. Really great question. And this artifact is called called a vase. So it would be called a vase or a vessel. Really good question, guys. Really good questions. So I'm just going to end our, our last bit here and talk about Asia, uh, specifically the Silk Road. So if we look here, we can see lots of different um, lots of different artifacts. Can you guys tell me in the chat box really quickly using those wonderful diagnostic eyes? What do you guys see that is the same in these objects? Name a couple things that you see that are similar in these objects that you see on the screen. Great, so somebody's calling out chariots, absolutely. So we have a whole bunch of what looks like chariots or wheeled um, transportation methods. Great, so we're talking about animals. We see lots of different animals and we also see people, great. Can you guys name some of those animals? Yes, calling out that transportation, I love it. Name some of those animals for me really quickly, great. So we have uh, some of the connections of the ideas of transportation, how they get around. We have camels being named. We have horses being named, absolutely. And I'll let you guys know, these are typically the horses right here as well. So one innovation we have here with transportation is the idea of domesticating animals to get from place to place. We see camels be used in areas that are deserts, right? That That's really where we see a lot of that connection. We see horses be used across the ancient world. And one of the biggest innovations that our, our friend named is the idea of a chariot, the wheel, how you're getting from place to place. Oh, yes, Maddie. So this is just a fragment, which means one piece of a coffin. So this was something that was um, drawn on somebody's coffin as a way of taking it to the afterlife. Really good question. And then also, guys, what you can see on these camels and these horses is they all have saddles. If they don't have saddles, they have reins that connect them to what they're transporting. And the, uh, the people there are extremely important because they're not only moving from place to place with them, but these individuals are responsible for these transport, right? They're gonna make sure these animals and these new innovations like the wheels and chariots are in place. And the people inside those chariots, trust me, they are important, okay? So these are some connections to why transportation becomes so important. Because eventually, eventually what we see is transportation is what helps connection. In the ancient world, people begin trading and bartering back and forth. There are areas that have specific objects and materials that not everybody has, right? So they start trading from one good to the next. Now, oh, that's fun. So now what we see and what's most important is that we need to communicate. And that comes to one of the most important innovations we had a hand in connecting. Uh, or helping um, a hand in helping discover, which is the Rosetta Stone. So the Rosetta Stone is specifically from ancient Egypt. It's a way of helping us understand how people communicated. This is just one example of an ancient language, but I thought we could play around a little bit to explain how this was deciphered. So now we have the idea that we have everything we need, right? Our shelter, our food, and our drink. We have things that we want, right? How we're gonna decorate our household and make sure our bodies are clean, how we're gonna be entertained with stories and make sure our clothing stays up. Then we know, okay, we're moving around. People are able to really expand how they're walking, how they're using rivers, all of that fun, so how they're using animals. 
Now let's talk about that communication. This is going to be our last piece here. So basically the Rosetta Stone is broken into three separate parts. The very top part is ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, a pictorial language. This type of symbol is what we call a pictograph. Guys, we have pictographs too. It's just like emojis. So tell me, what do, in the chat box, if I gave you this emoji sentence, that's me waving to you, can you tell me, what am I telling you in this sentence? If you want to read my pictorial sentence, my emojis, similar to how ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs are used up here, what do you think I'm telling you? Go ahead and give me some suggestions. So this is me. What am I telling you in this emoji sentence? You're saying, hi, I love books, eating, and games. Good suggestion. Any other suggestions? I agree. You have a really good suggest. You have some really good uh, feedback coming in there. So we have this, and then what we see is that in ancient Egypt, they use pictures to connect as well. On the second part of the Rosetta Stone, we have a Coptic language, a move to an alphabet. I like to kind of connect that to the idea of our hashtags, right? So you guys are suggesting I love eating and games. But I'm saying, hi, I love tacos and games. Really, really good. And then just like we see, oh, and look, you guys just added on. Hi, I love reading tacos and gaming, right? And as we can see in our second area, my hashtags here, I try to clear it up for you. I'm trying to say, hey, I love books. Hashtag, I'm always going to look for a hashtag with books. I always want to make my tacos better. I always am trying to game, as we've already talked about. I have lots of love, and these are a few of my favorite things. So I'm giving you a little bit more information, but it's not specifically clear, right? And that's what we're finding in the Rosetta Stone, that this language doesn't give us all the facts. It's not until we get down to the third area that's written in Greek where we get to see a little bit more information, a way that today we're able to use this innovation in language to help us understand and translate ancient world language and writing and communication. So what I was trying to say was, hi, I love to read books, eat tacos, and play video games, which you guys did a great job suggestion, uh, suggesting and getting uh, right here. It's just a way that we break down this Rosetta Stone. Now, I always like to say the Rosetta Stone, we had a hand in helping excavate. It currently lives in the British Museum. That's where you guys can go and check out more information. And this is one of the earlier, earlier forms of it being on display after excavation. Now, that's the end of my presentation. I hope you guys had so much fun. I think we're right at like the very end, but I'm happy to take questions. If you guys have it about our lesson, more about um, our idea of innovation, more information about these objects, if you're interested, whatever you guys would like to know, I'm happy to answer if we have the time. Miss Nally and Miss Katie, you let me know if, if we have the time. Yeah, we have the time. And Charlie and AJ said that was so much fun. That was really great to see all those. And I'm sure there's so many items in the museum. And Aaron said, oh, what's the second part of the Rosetta Stone called? Oh, great. So the Rosetta Stone, that's what's called Coptic language. So basically, once there was pictures, like we have emojis, right? Ancient Egyptians stopped drawing because it takes a lot of time. So they started to move toward an alphabet, like how we have our ABCs in the English language. So the idea is, is that it's first pictures, the first time people are trying to make words with an alphabet, and then it's Greece, uh, Greek, uh, an, a language you can still explore today. Very, very good question. And the Rosetta Stone is at the British Museum, correct? Correct. It's at, we help, we were a part of the joint excavation or expedition because sometimes you kind of need to work together uh, the different universities. So this is one example of what we um, what we found together, but that stays with them. And then in our Mesopotamia collection, we actually found a lot of ancient ore from them with them so they actually have some of the objects and we have some of the objects so it's kind of a, a divide based on how the archaeologists do it
Awesome. Okay, so I think that's really great. Next week we're going to, um, I think Miss Allison has a week off. I'm not sure, but we're going to do the King Tut tour yes. um, and see the Rosetta Stone again. Um, and we cannot wait to be working with you all summer. So thanks, Miss Allison. Yes, that was I so awesome, you. Allison. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm glad you guys liked it. I had so much fun and I can't wait to work with all of you guys all summer. Just like we said at the beginning of the lesson, we are here. We will always be here. And I love hanging out with you guys. So anything that I can do, I will do. Thank you guys so much. It was so good seeing you guys have fun with King Tut. Bye guys. <laughs> Bye. See you guys later for time.